Hello. It's a great pleasure to be here, and it's an honour to be giving the Adrian Leftwich Memorial Lecture. I never met him, but I read about him, and I've read some of his works. He made major contributions to the politics of development, in particular on the nature of the developmental state, and he argued that politics needs to be given primacy in development analysis, and he explored the nature of political coalitions which would be likely to support progressive change. His activities, as David said, extended well beyond analysis, and he worked actively and influentially with aid agencies here and in Australia and elsewhere. Now, you could conclude that there's nothing unusual or surprising about a political scientist giving primacy to politics. Um, yet, in some ways, this is incorrect, because economists have dominated the field of development, even to the extent of dominating political science. And after a lifetime as, of working as an economist in development, I'm convinced with Adrian that it's politics which should have primacy. And I think this view is increasingly being shared, partly due to his work. Uh, the critical importance of politics is especially apparent in the realm of inequality, because we know that inequality, as David just said, is absolutely at the top of the list of academics, interest and policy interest, and yet there is almost nothing being done about it. In fact, in many respects, and I won't say more now, I'm sure Alex will say a lot about this, in many respects the reverse. So it's a very appropriate topic to be starting with. And I start with a quotation from Rousseau, which I hope you were reading whilst I was talking, which basically Rousseau is a huge egalitarian, saying that citizens agreed to a social contract under which each would be equal. Um, and what I'm going to do in this lecture is to consider what some major philosophers and economists have had to say about the distribution of resources in relation both to vertical and to horizontal inequality. And I'm going to consider briefly some how this might frame policy and say a little bit about the political economy of such change. So I'll start with thinking about definitions, and then I'll come along to the different uh, approaches. So let me start with defining inequality. And there are two questions when you define inequality. Well, there are many questions, but two very critical ones. Uh, inequality among whom? And the second one is inequality of what? And inequality among whom seems a bit obvious because everyone measures it among individuals in a society, or mostly, or among households. And that's what I'll call vertical inequality. But there's another inequality which I've been working about a lot, and that is inequality among groups, groups of people with a common identity. Now, people can be grouped in a variety of ways, and there are many, many different ways of grouping people. I could group this room, you know, into people on that side and people on that side, but it wouldn't be a very interesting group. What we want to know is what are the salient differences between people, the sort of differences that people mind about, that other people mind about, they categorize them in that way, that they mobilize behind, that they become political. These are salient differences, and it's when you have salient differences of this sort that this sort of horizontal inequality becomes important. And in each society, there'll be different ways, many ways of grouping people, and it's always good to group people in many ways, not in a unique way. But in each society, there are some ways which are more salient than others. And for example, in many African societies, ethnicity is a very dominant um, type of uh, identity. Increasingly, religion is, as we know, a becoming a tremendously important form of identity. Uh, it's not necessarily a whole religion, as we know in the Middle East. It's sub subgroups of religions, different type, different sects of a religion. Um, we have race as being very important in some areas, caste, gender, age, class, nationality. So many different ways of identifying horizontal inequalities. And I'd like to emphasize, without going into great detail, that I'm not being primordial and saying people are born with an identity and it's them and that's, I can tell you, just because you're born with it. And, but it is constructed. It's constructed historically. It's constructed over time. Um, you know, uh, the colonials really invented uh, ethnicities in Africa and made them, rigidified them. And they're fluid over time. So we're not saying there is just one identity. Nonetheless, they're very important to people at any one point in time. And people regard them as primordial, in a sense. If you ask uh, somebody, 
you know, who they are, what they are. They feel very strongly that they are this or that. They don't think, oh, well, it just happens that this is some sort of social construction. Um, well, that's what I want to say about inequality among whom, and I'm going to be focusing on these two types. I could go on to other inequality categorizations like countries and so on, but for the moment I'm going to look at horizontal and vertical inequality. <laughs> Next question is, inequality of what? And that is the famous Sen question, and in answering Amartya Sen, in answering that question, he began to evolve the capabilities approach. And his, his answer was, it's inequality, what matters is capabilities, what people can be and do, and that's what the dimension in which inequality should be. Of course, economists normally think about income inequality and they normally think about vertical inequality. So Sen is, was moving it towards capabilities, a different dimension. When we think about horizontal inequality, I want to think about four dimensions, all of which are very important to people and which cause them to mobilize. And these are economic inequalities of a whole range of types, not just income, but assets and so on, social inequalities, education, health, and so on, political inequalities, power, uh, and cultural inequalities, respect for people's culture. All these things are clearly very um, important to people. Some are much more important than others. And which people think are important may vary across societies. In some, you know, in our society, we regard health as absolutely critical. Maybe most societies do. In others, it might be something else. Um, religion is a very important uh, dimension for some people. Um, So let me now turn, and what I want to do now is I'm going to be thinking about justice and what people have said about justice, and I'm not possibly covering the whole realm, but I want to um, think both about what philosophers have said about what would be a just distribution and what economists have said about what would be a just distribution, and I want to think about it both in relation to horizontal and vertical inequality. So starting with philosophers, I'm looking at three categories of thought, those based on people being all human, those based on the idea of a social contract, and those based on entitlements. Starting with those based on everyone being human, the idea is that everyone is entitled to something because they're human. And, and Immanuel Kant probably put this most uh, clearly, that everybody, because they're human, should be treated equally, always as an end, and should get equality of respect. Now, he didn't say anything much about material inequality. What does that mean about material inequality, the things that we are thinking about mainly? Um, I think it has something to say about material inequality. If you have gross inequalities in resources and so on, so some people are begging on the streets and some people are in their um, Bentleys, you do not get equality of respect. So there's a certain amount of equality that you need in order to get equality of respect. You could argue that this has been um, carried on, the, the principle of humanity and equality of humans, carried on in the human rights approach to development. And in there, clearly, following the conventions of the United Nations, there are a whole lot of human rights that people are, have, have rights to. It's been agreed they have rights to. And these do not imply equality. They imply that people should at least get a basic minimum in terms of health, in terms of um, economic resources, and so on and so forth. Um, so it's not, one can't say that the human rights approach uh, really says there should be equality, but says that there should be much less inequality than we have today, because uh, certain people just are not getting access to the human rights that we've agreed upon. What about this distinction between vertical and horizontal inequality? I would say that the human rights approach is, really relates more to vertical than to horizontal, um, but there are aspects which relate to horizontal, which is, for example, the rights of people to development, the right to development and so on, the right against discrimination, cultural rights, but mostly they relate to uh, vertical inequality. Now I want to turn to the social contract, and we go back to Rousseau and the quotation I started with. And the modern version of Rousseau is, the, um, is Rawls. And Rawls, as is famously known, I'm sure to everybody, he starts with the idea that you 
determine the just distribution of resources under a veil of ignorance. You don't know where you're going to be when you turn up. And therefore, if you were in this ignorance, what would you choose? And he said, what you'd choose is that the worst person or group should, should maximize their position. Now, what does that mean in terms of inequality? It doesn't mean complete equality. It depends, if you think about the worst person or the worst group, what arrangement in society would be such that the lowest group would be at its highest level? What would bring about maximin? Now, if we think about individuals within a society, we can argue that you need a certain amount of inequality for incentives and so on, because people might not otherwise fully uh, work out their talents and so on. So you could argue that it would justify a certain amount of vertical inequality. Probably far less than we have today, but a certain amount of vertical inequality. What about horizontal inequality? Here, I think it's much more difficult to argue that the Rawls approach would necessarily involve all that much inequality, because what we're thinking about is large groups. Imagine it's men and women, or blacks and whites, as your big groups. It's because um, you're assuming that some people are more talented than others, and therefore they need incentives to use their talents. Some people work harder than others, they need incentives to, to, use, to work hard. That we justify a certain amount of inequality in, with respect to vertical inequality, that these incentives are necessary to make, um, to make an efficient outcome. But when we're talking about large groups of people, it's very difficult to see why you would need uh, that sort of incentive, because within each group, there will be a great range of talent, a great range of people. You may well need incentives within the group, inequality within the group, in order to bring out the most efficient out outcome. But it's very difficult to see why one should need inequality between the groups. So I think that this approach justifies a certain amount of vertical inequality, much less horizontal inequality. Um, now, I want to move to the entitlement approach. Now, this is famously a justification for inequality. It's well known people regard this as sort of justification for republicanism in the US. Starts with Locke, who is not so inegalitarian, but says that in a state of nature, people are entitled to property, which is the outcome of their own labor. Well, of course, that limits it. If it's your, only your own labor, there's a certain amount, only limited amount of inequality you'll get. And also, he adds, only, you can only accum accumulate enough, as much as you can use before it spoils. Given this was in the era before fridges, there wasn't all that much you could accumulate, actually. But Nonetheless, it's often interpreted as justifying property rights and inequality. In the modern version, we have Nozick. And he is basically, both of them say, as long as the process is just, the outcome is just. So for Locke, it's if you work with your own labor, that's the process. Then whatever happens, the outcome is just. For Nozick, it's any legitimate way of acquiring resources. And legitimacy includes inheritance. So it follows, therefore, that you could get huge amounts of inequality because you might quite legitimately be more entrepreneurial than another person, and then you leave it to your children, and they leave it to their children, and it's all quite legitimate, and you get these huge inequalities. And then, according to Nozick, this is perfectly just because you've, filled a ju you've done it justly. But there's a big exception in the Nozick ap apparatus, and that is what he calls the principle of rectification. And that applies if the resources weren't acquired legitimately. Then, even generations later, you, it's just to redistribute back to the original people. And when we look about at horizontal inequalities, many of them were not, did, do not have just origins. As he says, some people steal from others, defraud them, or enslave them. If you think about the horizontal inequalities in the world today, say racial inequalities in the US, enslavement, defraud, and so on. If you think about inequalities between genders, you can argue that it has an illegitimate origin. Uh, many fortunes are built on stealing. So when one comes to think about um, horizontal inequalities, even Nozick justifies much less inequality than we would commonly see today. He sort of approves of vertical, but I think it's very difficult to approve of most of the horizontal inequalities, certainly the type of ones that we work with in developing countries where colonial origins are really at the heart 
of so much of the inequalities. So let me now turn to economists. Economists have two sets of reasons for um, justifying inequality. One is intrinsic, or justifying equality, and, one, and the other is instrumental. And intrinsic reasons are what, you know, what is basically just what I've been talking about. And surprisingly, in a way, economists started, not started, but it, certainly in the 19th century, early 20th century, putting a lot of emphasis on intrinsic reasons because the utilitarian basis of economics uh, provided a justification for an egalitarian distribution. Basically, as you learn in first year economics, there is diminishing marginal utility. As you get more of something, you eat more apples, you get less utility from each extra apple. So Pigou argued, well, that's true, but it's also true if you get more money. So if everybody had the same preference curve and everybody got more money, the way to maximize utility would be to have equality of distribution. And indeed, that's what Pigou said. He said, basically, people have equal capacity for satisfaction and diminishing marginal utility of income. So he was a strong egalitarian. Um, but then an economist called Lionel Robbins came along and said, you know, this is absolutely ridiculous. People don't get equal satisfaction from everything. In our heart of hearts, we know that different men's satisfaction from similar means, similar means is not equally valuable. I, I love the sort of evidence. Nowadays, economists wouldn't get away with supporting a huge, important change in the whole profession by just talking about their heart of hearts um, and only talking about men also. But anyway, this had a dramatic influence on the economics profession. It became an absolute sort of totally belief, an, an essential belief of economists that you cannot compare different people's utility. And that being so, you can't say anything about distribution at all. You can leave it to the politicians, you can just maximize what's there. So intrinsic reasons were thrown out of the window. But we still have instrumental reasons, and economists accept instrumental reasons. Um, so more inequality is justified because of incentive effects and savings effects that likely to, likely to improve growth. And more equality is justified because it improves human resources. If you have more equality, people are better fed, they're better workers, they're better educated, and so on and so forth. So the question is then, which, is, which applies in practice if we look at things empirically, what's, what's the outcome? Most of the empirical investigations say that more equality is better for growth, uh, but not all of them, there are some exceptions. Um, and they do also say that it's better for the sustain, sustained growth. Some re, even some IMF economists have recently shown that if you want sustained growth, it's better to have more equality. Um, Andrea Cornier, who did a lot of work on inequality, does a lot of work on inequality, concluded that looking across countries, too much equality was bad for growth and too much inequality was bad for growth, and you needed sort of moderate equality, which is, may well be the case. Um, the World Bank itself has moved from talking about equality of um, outcome to talking about equality of opportunity. And that's sort of an intrinsic economist view that people should have equality of opportunity if you wanted to maximize output. Because if you don't, then huge swathes of people may not be getting a fair opportunity and therefore you're not using all your talent. Um, and so we find that uh, that was Roma in, in an important book in 1998 initiated this and this has been taken up by a lot of people. And equality of opportunity is equality in all circumstances um, which are not in control of the individual. And the things that are not in control of the individual are morally irrelevant predetermined circumstances, such as race, gender, place of birth, and family background. Now, if you read that list carefully, you realize that that is horizontal inequality. So essentially, the new sort of view of equality of opportunity is saying... Um, yes, we may need inequality vertically, but no, horizontal inequality implies lack of equality of opportunity. And that really permeates the idea of how to maximize efficiency. It gets back to what I was saying about 
um, about uh, the earlier Rawls view, maxim in, that if you want efficiency, yes, you may need some vertical inequality, but no, horizontal inequality is likely to impede efficiency because you're not using everyone's talents fully. When there are other instrumental reasons why we should care about inequality, um, and the one I've been working on a lot is um, the way in which horizontal inequalities raise the risk of conflict. And it, there's a lot of evidence, accumulating evidence, that that is the case. So that's a very serious point, obviously, because if it also impedes growth, if that's what one cares about, but one also cares about peace and stability. So that's a huge issue, which applies to horizontal inequality, and oddly not to vertical. A lot of investigations have suggested that vertical inequality doesn't have much to do with conflict. It does have something, however, to do with criminality. So in order to reduce criminality, you need less vertical inequality. Um, other instrumental reasons, um, well, I've talked about homicides. It's been argued that inequalities associated with worsening health. Um, Wil Wilkinson and the spirit level have gone through a whole range of things which, in which what inequality damages. I mean, I think their, their, their standard of evidence is better than that of Robbins, but it's not too too high, but anyway, they certainly uh, argue that it, health is associated with more inequality. And the recent happiness literature has tended to show that more inequality um, increases unhappiness, but it, this varies across society. And in the US, for example, they like inequality, but in many other countries, more inequality is damaging to aggregate happiness. Um, so, in summary, if we look at the question of group versus individuals, as far as philosophers are concerned, um, common humanity is basically about vertical inequality. The Rawlsian social contract says more horizontal inequality justifies some vertical inequality. And Nozick justifies endless amounts of vertical inequality, but not a lot of the horizontal inequality. If we turn to economists, um, the intrinsic reasons have been thrown out of the window by, by Robbins. But I must say, if you try and interpret his heart of hearts argument in terms of groups, it's very difficult to justify. In our heart of hearts, we don't believe that men and women are equally satisfied with the same, get equal satisfaction from the same income. We couldn't say it. I mean, it's just so politically incorrect, his whole statement, if you substituted groups for people, that I think you'd have to throw that one out. Um, but as far as instrumental reasons are concerned, the same conclusions as with Maximin, that it's much easier instrumentally to justify a certain amount of vertical inequality than it is to justify horizontal inequality. And, and other instrumental reasons, some of them are against vertical, some of them against horizontal. So let, the conclusion then of this very quick survey of philosophers, some, some philosophers and some economists, is that it's difficult to justify important dimensions of inequality across groups. More arguments in favor of vertical inequality, but here too, the amount that we see to do today is excessive. So now I want to consider a little bit about policy and, and politics. So the policy implications, we should limit vertical inequality, we should try and eliminate horizontal inequality. And I think it's helpful to think of four different types of policy. Direct and indirect policies. Direct policies are policies in which you take certain groups and target them for certain scholarships, like affirmative action, basically, which you can do in relation to class, income group, race, and so on. And indirect policies are policies which get at the same thing, but you don't actually target groups. So progressive taxation, if you, the poorer group ought to benefit more than the richer group, or, or um, a general increase in health expenditure, for example. There are a whole lot of general policies which have the effect, have strong distributional effects. So those are two types of policy. And as far as the um, direct policies are concerned, they have a lot of advantages because they are very visible. Now, that's an advantage and a disadvantage. They're visible, and therefore, the group affected feels better about them. They're visible, and therefore, the group that suffers 
gets angry about them. So it depends what the balance of your politics is, is at the time, whether the visibility is an advantage or a disadvantage. And what we've found with our research is that visibility can be a big advantage when you first introduce these policies. For example, affirmative action in the US in response to race riots, it really did solve that particular era of race riots. But over time, the visibility really raises aggression in the opposition, which is what you see today. So it's an advantage in the beginning, but then becomes more of a disadvantage. But it's very direct in achieving its effects. Uh, on the other hand, indirect policies, um, they tend to take much longer to achieve the effects. They're much less direct, clearly. So there are many more leakages if you're worried about horizontal inequality. So you, you, meet, you don't do so well about uh, narrowing the gaps necessarily. Um, but they may arouse less opposition. Question whether they get enough support to put, be put in in the first place. Another type of policy distinction that I like to make is between pre-distribution and redistribution. Pre-distribution is all those things that you do to a distribution before people actually get that money. And redistribution is once they've got it, you take it away again, or you give them more. So pre-distribution policies are things like raising the minimum wage, introducing a maximum wage, all sorts of things like that. Redistribution is taxation and public expenditure. And again, um, they might have the same effect, but politically they're different. So they're worth thinking about because it might be politically more acceptable, some of the pre-distribution. I think people find it most annoying to get the money and then have it taken away than not getting it in the first place. Um, well, this is just a categorization. To, I've been talking all the time about economics, but just to show you that you can apply a lot of these um, categories to politics and to cultural status as well. It's not only economics. If we come back a little bit to the direct and indirect policies, I've already talked a lot about this, but one of the points that is often made is that direct policies, that is affirmative action, might worsen distribution within the group. And this really depends on the design of policies. In South Africa, there were a lot of affirmative action policies which essentially gave people rights to property at the very top end, and they were very um, inegalitarian among blacks. But in Malaysia, there were a lot of policies which were directed at employment, and they were quite egalitarian, so it varies. Um, well, here we come to indirect policies. I think I'll, I'll skip that one. I think it's worth talking a little bit about the relationship between policies which improve vertical and improve horizontal inequality. It's, it's worth pointing out that you can, you can reduce horizontal inequalities and at the same time worsen vertical inequalities, and clearly you don't want to do that, and that's the design of policies is going to affect that. And usually, effective policies to reduce vertical inequalities will also reduce horizontal inequalities. So there's some advantage about that, but as I said, it's rather slow. So essentially, I think you need to look carefully at both sets of policies in order to achieve a reduction of both horizontal and vertical inequalities. Now, politics are key, and here I quote Adrian Leftwich. The challenge for policy-oriented research is not simply to explore the profoundly difficult problems of state building or the design and funding of welfare regimes, I've been trying to do the latter, but how to identify, support and encourage the political forces and coalitions which alone will create and sustain the institutional arrangements of effective states. I think that is critical, that's the critical issue. Um, and whether this can be done from outside at all, I doubt, but maybe we can ha have policies which sort of encourage it. So what are the political constraints and opportunities in the realm that we've been thinking about? There is a particular problem, it's argued, about redistribution horizontally. And that is, comes from social psychologists, which is that the argument that you don't mind distributing your own income to your own group, and you, mind, you do mind doing it across groups that your moral domain or your scope of justice is within a group and not across groups. Now, I don't know if that's so. Or it's certainly true nationally. We feel very strongly much more about national, uh, the welfare of our national citizens than we do internationally. Is it true about groups? It's an empirical 
issue. Um, and I, our surveys show that some societies are much more prepared to distribute across groups than others. Uh, but it is a major issue which we need to confront as far as horizontal inequality is concerned. And it's why, I mean, when people think of people as the other, they don't mind about their welfare nearly so much as when they think of them as themselves. And that's why part of this whole policy realm is nothing to do with the actual policies I've been talking about, but how to get people to view other people in a different sort of way. Um, now, where there's one dominant group that's numerically dominant, it's you can impose the policies. That was the case, for example, in Sri Lanka and Fiji and Malaysia. Or um, where there is actual conflict, you may decide, desire to have the policies in order to stop the conflict. And that was the situation, for example, in the United States. So there are things which will overcome that, but it, the most desirable situation is a national consensus in which each citizen is regarded as equally justified, going back in a way to the whole Kant view that each citizen deserves equal respect, and not only just each citizen, but each member of the global community deserves equal respect. Um, now, as I said, consensus can follow conflicts, but it doesn't always happen. And ending conflicts, particularly if one side wins in a major way, can actually be harmful to redistribution, and we've seen that recently in the case of Sri Lanka. Or it can lead to denial, which I think is the case in Rwanda, where you're not allowed to even measure horizontal inequality, and where, in my view, if you'd put the bits and pieces together, horizontal inequality is worsening. Um, so th that's a quite dangerous situation. Um, we do find that addressing both horizontal and vertical inequality can be the consequence of a generally progressive government. Uh, and we have some many cases in Latin America at the moment. Um, have I got the right? So, um, many cases in Latin America at the moment which are like that. Uh, and here we go back to this business, uh, the question which I, was in the left which quote. What has made Latin American governments recently so progressive? And that's a huge issue. But, you know, if we're going to do it very quickly, if you look very quickly, it has been a long-term struggle of workers and peasants and so on to get political power. Um, so it's a long-term thing, and it has not been at all anything to do with us outsiders. It's been an internal struggle. Maybe the outsiders have had something to do with causing... Uh, switch to democracy, and democracy has given people the space to have this struggle. Um, but it's been an internal struggle. Now, this is just to show you that the percentage of people approving redistribution across groups in four African countries that we looked at varies hugely. This was from an attitude survey. And you find that um, in Nigeria, it's as low as one-fifth. And it's not so surprising if we know about Nigeria and we know that the critical issue and problem is the north-south issue and this a huge, huge country and a lack of sense of identity across the country as com being common citizens. Kenya is a bit better. Now, Ghana is famous for being a very uh, unified uh, country where the national project was, Nkrumah introduced the national project right from independence and that's always been up front and has a high proportion of approval. Uganda, I'm a little bit puzzled by that very high figure. Now, that was, you know, attitudes towards horizontal inequality. But what about attitudes towards vertical inequality? Um, you'd think that in democracies there'd be strong support because the majority of people are below the national average. So you'd think they'd all want redistribution. But in fact... And of course, there is a lot of redistribution, I'll, sh I'll show you later, in, in a lot of countries. So it's not that they don't want any, but they don't want as much as one might think. Um, and the evidence shows that attitudes towards redistribution tend to get more hostile as average incomes go up. Um, and the support is argued, but I'm not sure there's very strong ev evidence, argued to decline as you have a more heterogeneous society, coming back to the point that people, like, people want to think about themselves as a single group. 
Uh, and major redistribution occurs usually after some great national crisis or national struggle. So going to the Piketty curves, it's very clear if you look at Piketty's curves, and he says so, that it's been after each of the world wars that you have a sort of boost in, in redistributive policies, and then a gradual moving away from them after that. But I think also of importance is global norms. And global norms are important in all sorts of ways, and so are national norms. But national norms are very much affected by global norms. Um, global norms are, in, in part, you know, the World Bank manages to push them out all over, um, not, not in a redistribution, redistributionary way at the moment, but uh, they, they are clearly important. And there's argued by Tony Atkinson that the global norms, the global tolerance of inequality has, has increased. In other words, people mind less, much less about inequality, despite what we're now saying about inequality, than they used to. Well, he, he, he did this lecture a few years ago. But he was saying, well, you know, in the olden days, so to speak, you know, a ratio of nine to one for the chief executive to the lowest paid was regarded as, you know, excessive. And now you have these gross 150 to one sort of ratios, and people may be beginning to think they're excessive, but they're not doing very much about them. So I feel that global norms are important, and I feel that our task as a sort of academic community is to contribute to the formation of global norms, or as a policy-making community, is to contribute towards the formation of global norms, and that these do affect um, policy in all sorts of direct and indirect ways. Um, now, finally, to end, I just want to show you some curves to show you that um, you can have redistribution. Because sometimes, you know, you, you talk about how terrible inequality is, as I've been doing, and how there's all this resistance to redistribution. And it's helpful, I think, to see that it's not, you know, there is redistribution around the world. So it's not impossible at all. And the first curve that you, the first graph you see here is the um, case of Malaysia. And it's the inequalities between the Malays and the Chinese, which are the critical ones. And at the beginning in 70, you can see huge inequality. And then by 2009, you can see that as a result of very deliberate and direct policies, you can see that they've been reduced hugely. And I'd like to emphasize that this was at a time when Malaysia did extremely well economically. So it hasn't been at the cost of the economy. The next. Um, set of uh, next graph is Northern Ireland. Now, people think the peace process in Northern Ireland was all due to, say, Tony Blair and Clinton, and I don't know what. I don't think so. I think it was due to some economic and social policies which produced much nearer equality between the communities. And what you see here is the first, the, the sort of blue one is the position in the 70s, and the red one is the position in the 90s, and then higher the the higher the, um, gra the chart, the nearer to one, the nearer to equality. And so what you see is that in every category, there was a huge advance during this period. And so by the time that the peace negotiations were going on, we had near equality between the communities in a lot of respects. And in fact, now I think education is better for, among the Catholics than among the Protestants. And it's interesting here, because this stops in the 1990s, that the police made least progress, and that was the issue which was continuously negotiated and nearly brought the whole peace process to an end, and it's much better now. Now, finally, this is just to show you that in um, developed countries, there's been a lot of redistribution, and so it's wrong to think that we, you know, we do nothing. Um, and this is how far the genie fell as a result of redistribution in a whole range of countries, with Denmark being the most, the, the biggest fall. And the top bit, the one with um, diagonal lines, is the result of taxation. And the bottom bit, the blue bit, is the result of public expenditure. And that in itself is interesting, because on the whole, um, public expenditure is much more redistributive than taxation. And, and that's a very important point to bear in mind, because often people criticize taxation. They say it's just proportionate to income, which is true broadly for most developing countries. 
But that still means it can be very redistributive because the expenditure is not proportionate to income. So if you have more taxation and more expenditure, you get better distribution. Um, so finally, I want to end with another quotation from Rousseau. It is precisely because the force of circumstances tends continually to destroy equality that the force of legislation should always tend to its maintenance. And I would also add that academic debate and political movements need also always to tend to its maintenance. Thank you. Okay, um, I'd just take a couple more and um, take them in the group. Yes, yeah. in the middle, the white shirt. Uh, thanks, Francis. Um, I just wanted to know if you could say a little bit more about the politics of identity, certainly uh, uh, over a long period of time. You said, you know, they do change. Uh, do you, has there been any obvious examples where the politics are uh, explicit? like in uh, Rwanda and the ethnicity or gender politics and otherwise has made a clear uh, contribution. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And I'll take one final question. Or not? Ah, yes, at the back there. Edward, just back a little bit. Yeah, there you go. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I wonder, um, you sort of talk about the policy level and the academic level of pushing global agendas. Um, how do you think you go about that without being radical if the global agenda isn't, isn't as you want it to be? Okay. Thank you. Three very profound questions. <laughs> On the first one, I think it would be really interesting to think more clearly than I have about the different principles because um, clearly, intuitively, if I talked about inequality of access to air, we would find it completely unacceptable. Um, and I, rem I remember there was a, a well-known article by Arrow saying that we are more tolerant of, we're more intolerant of specific inequalities than of general inequalities. And by that he meant that if you say people have different access to health, people are a bit shocked, or food. But if you say they have different access to income, it's sort of an abstraction and they don't mean less. So I think, I mean, I do think the different theories would have different things to say. I mean, obviously, human rights, you're talking about really fundamental uh, things that, such as having enough food, having enough education, and so on. And whether you have equal access to luxury lot, yachts is neither here nor there. So I think if one thought it out very carefully, one, one could come to different principles, and the different as people would come to different principles. But they, in terms of horizontal inequality, I think there's a, a general presumption that there's no particular reason why you shouldn't have equality in all the dimensions, uh, except that you know some groups may not, certainly some people may not want to be brilliant footballers or something. And so you don't want to impose on them a particular pattern of life so that they have equality. Like the kibbutz, you know, did tended to impose upon people that they had to have equality of everything, even if they would have rather some people wanted books and other people wanted uh, TVs, you know. But I do think it's an important issue, and I think the politics. I, I haven't been into, into, didn't go into the politics, but if you go into politics and culture, well, then you are talking about group rights, um, and then I think you do need uh, you for political stability at least you need each group to have a significant amount of power, but exactly how much should it be proportionate to the population, which could well mean if they're minority, they don't have power at all, on how you would fix it so that even if they're minority, they would still have enough say in the political system to, to make it seem just from their point of view. I think these are very difficult issues, but very interesting question. Now, when it comes to conflict, it's difficult to know because so many of these inequalities go together, which is the critical inequality. But what we have found, I don't think income is, because honestly, people don't know what people's income is. You find that what they mind about is things they notice. So they notice employment a lot, and they notice land because it, that's very visible. But more invisible ones, they don't mind so much. But the other general finding we've made is that it's particularly likely to be conflictual if you have both economic and political inequalities that 
go in the same direction. So one group is deprived in both politics and <coughs> economics. If a group's deprived <coughs> in economics but has political power, well, then they begin to do something about it. They mind much less about it. So it's not so damaging. Or if they don't have political power, but they have, which is the sort of obverse, they have a lot of economic power, um, that's, that also can, can be more stable. Now, the, the econometric shows that that too increases the risk, even if you're forgetting about political power. But if you have both together, that's what is most risky. And there are a lot of case studies showing that. Now, on the politics of identity, yeah, it's very interesting and very important, the way people's identity change. For example, um, and that's one issue about politics, if a, if a political leaders are deprived of political power, or if potential leaders are deprived of political power, one of their strategies is to accentuate their identity and have ethnic um, coalitions and various ethnic uh, groups which will support them and the, eventually to use them even for violence. And you can actually see, trace this forward, say in the um, Cote d'Ivoire conflict, you can actually see people doing that. In the Rwanda conflict, you can see the way that the extremists, Hutus, developed consciousness of that um, identity and made the other seem, uh, you know, was debased the other. And the same thing in the, in the European Holocaust. So identities can, uh, well, maybe not created out of nothing, but they can be accentuated by leaders, by um, newspapers. I mean, in this country, the way we're demonizing Muslims at the moment is an example. And it's a sort of identity that's becoming very etched into certainly the non-Muslims' views of people. Um, and so, yeah, they created over time, and the politics of it is tremendously important. Now, what was the last one? Oh, yeah, can you, um, what can we do? Well, I. Academics are always, you know, sort of thought to be in their little ivory towers and, and not, shouldn't notice these things. But I think those of us who work in the realm of development really, even if we said we were in the ivory towers, we are taking a political stance by being in our ivory tower. So I don't believe that we can be totally neutral. Do we necessarily have to be very radical if, um, well, if we disagree with um, the major conventional wisdom? Yes. We are radical. I mean, whether that means that we're radical to the extent of uh, uh, what, what, what it means beyond writing. I think we're radical in our writings. Some of us as individuals will also be radical in our political activities, but that's sort of separate. Um, so I think, I don't think there's a duty on academics to be radical. I think academics have to decide themselves where their research leads them. And they may decide that what they, they lead them, they publish them in some journal, and then that's it. I mean, one of the things I've learned after a long career, I used to think when I was young that if I wrote a good article and just published it, then I could move on to the next thing and everyone would pick up the big good article and that would change things. I learned that that's not how things work at all. And if you do want to change things, you have to repeat yourself rather a lot. You have to go into all sorts of domains and do this, that, and the other. I learned that particularly working with UNICEF an adjustment with the human face, where they really pushed that book and, and what a big effect it had, whereas we might have written the same thing and put it in Oxford Development Studies, my journal. Nothing would have happened at all. Um, so it's a matter of choice how far you want to take your ideas. Wonderful, thank you. Um, and um, I'd just like to thank you for um, what's possibly um, the best start we could have had, certainly laying the foundations for the rest of the day, and it's a, a proper tour de force. So again, um, thank you to Professor Stewart.